Yahweh, hello. Good evening, and I must say it's really wonderful to see you, well, it was a moment ago before the lights went down. It's wonderful to see you all here at the University of Sydney's flagship public talks program, Sydney Ideas. I'm Jennifer Barrett, the Pro Vice Chancellor Indigenous Academic and a Professor of Museum and Heritage Studies here at the University of Sydney. Uh, Dungari and my family mob, and on my mother's side, and uh, I just want many of you to know that I've told them to behave online tonight. <laughs> I'm your host for tonight's event, Voices on the Voice, a discussion about the Indigenous Voice to Parliament, presented together with the Indigenous Strategy and Services Portfolio, led by Professor Lisa jackson Pulver, and the National Centre for Cultural Competence, led by uh, Gabrielle, uh, Associate Professor Gabrielle Russell. Now, to begin with, um, I've been given the task of, with a bit of housekeeping here. So before we get things underway, um, I'd just like to let you know that live captioning is available. For those of you watching the live stream, turn on the uh, uh, closed captions feature in the video player to enable this. For our audience in the room, please switch your phones to silent. And in the event of an emergency, the exits are the doors from where you came in. Look to the Seymour Centre staff for direction. There will be an opportunity to ask questions in the second half of the hour. More on how to participate in the Q&A. Um, we'll get to that and I'll sort of outline how that's going to go. We're recording this event, so video and podcast on demand will be available. Again, we'll let you know a bit more about that later on. Now, for the first part of tonight's proceedings, I'd like to introduce esteemed elder, Uncle Chika Madden, to welcome us to country. Uncle Chika. I'm over here, Uncle. Uh, good evening, folks. My name is Charles Madden, but known around the inner city of Sydney as Chicka. Now, that's a nickname that I got many, many years ago going to Redfern Public School, which is now NCIE, the National Centre of Indigenous Excellence. Folks, I'm from Gadigal land, Aboriginal land. That's the land we're on at the moment. For many, many years, I've lived and worked around the city of Sydney. I've been involved with many a different Aboriginal organisations over the years. I've been a director with the Aboriginal Medical Service at Redfern for over 40 years. Also a director with the Redfern Aboriginal Housing Company, Aboriginal Hostels Australia, and the Metropolitan Local Aboriginal Land Council. I've got to mention it, folks. Also, a life member of the Redfern All Blacks Rugby League Football Club. <laughs> thank you. Folks, I'd like to take this opportunity this evening to extend a warm and sincere welcome to all of my Aboriginal brothers and sisters, non-Aboriginal brothers and sisters. If we have any brothers and sisters here from the Torres Strait, or further afar across the seas. Welcome. Welcome to Gadigal land. The Gadigal clan is one of 29 that makes up the Eora Nation. The Eora Nation is bordered by three distinctive landmarks. We have the Orkesbury River to the north, and the Peen to the west, and the Georges River to the south. Those three rivers form the boundaries of the Eora Nation. Folks, if you've travelled across this great city of ours today, the state, or this great country, or from afar, welcome. Welcome to Gadigal land. Enjoy your stay. Have a safe and trouble-free trip home. Once again, welcome, welcome, welcome. Thank you. Enjoy the night. Have a safe trip home. Thank you. Thank you, Uncle Chica. 
That was a wonderfully warm welcome, and I too would like to acknowledge the Gadigal of the Eora Nation and pay my respects to custodians of this land, a land that's never been ceded. I now invite Professor Mark Scott, Vice-Chancellor and President of the University of Sydney, to introduce this event and our keynote speaker tonight. Vice-Chancellor. Well, thank you, Jennifer, and a particular thank you to Uncle Chicken Madden for your warm welcome to country this evening. And can I also begin by acknowledging the traditional owners on the land where we meet, the Gadigal people, and pay my respects to elders past and present. It's wonderful to have such a large crowd with us tonight in person and an even larger group watching online. It's a tribute to the reputation of our guest speaker and to the importance of the subject for discussion tonight that we had to change this venue to meet the demand, which swamped the seating capacity of the Charles Perkins Centre Auditorium, or for that matter, the Great Hall. As the nation moves towards the referendum, places like the University of Sydney must welcome and host the conversation to explore the big ideas, challenge the veracity of arguments, and debate the compelling issues facing the nation, to engage and to respond. In the months ahead at the University of Sydney, we want many opportunities for our students to engage with this critical national conversation, to be fully informed and equipped to play their vital role in responding when the vote is called. It is essential, as this is a community based on the principle of leadership for good. Today's students are set to play vital roles in the future of this nation in the generations ahead. And it is hard to conceive of a more critical nation-shaping event for the century ahead than this vote. The national consideration around the voice also triggers other meaningful conversations on campus. This referendum harkens some back to 1967, where the referendum followed the freedom rides that set out from the University of Sydney, led by Charles Perkins, with others, others who also emerged as great leaders for good, like Jim Spiegelman. We take great pride in Charles Perkins, the first Aboriginal graduate from this university, truly a leader for good. We've named one of our most significant buildings and research centres after him. But we should also be sobered to remember that this university operated for a century before any First Nations man or woman graduated from here. And as a leading part of the established political and social infrastructure in this country, we too, in many ways, supported or enabled the policies and programs that entrenched disadvantaged and denied the opportunity for so many who over the lost decades should have been flourishing here. Dealing with such matters in our past is unfinished business, as is completing the ambitions spelt out in our One Sydney Many People strategy. Our work addressing these matters needs to continue. But all that leads us to another leader for good, tonight's guest speaker, Noel Pearson. He is a proud leader from the Gugu Yimadia community of Hopevale on the eastern Cape, Cape York Peninsula. He is also an alumnus of the University of Sydney. He is, as we all know, a household name through his indefatigable commitment to defending the rights of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. His work on the Uluru Statement of the Heart was recognised by the awarding of the Sydney Peace Prize last year, of which this university is a proud supporter. Noel was unable to join us at the dinner celebrating the award last year, which is another reason why we are thrilled to have him back on campus to speak with us tonight. Will you please join me in welcoming Noel Pearson?
Thank you very much, Mark. Thank you for your presence here tonight. Thank you to the National Centre and Sydney Ideas for this privilege. I pay respect to the Gadigal of the Eora Nation. I pay respect to the Elders and bring greetings from Cape York Peninsula. Here at my alma mater, I spent some quiet years. That I was lonely, I realised many years after. My small circle of friends with whom I lived, first in Summerhill and then Balmain, were my entire social world. And to them I owe uncompensable debts for sustaining me through two degrees at this university. My student friends, I counted on a saw miller's hand <laughs> with no need for the missing digits. Suffice, there was no cultural competence on campus in the early 80s. I heard rumour of two Aboriginal students when I arrived 17 years old, but we never met. The graffiti confounded me. Like today's internet, says Pitt, it's an on anonymity in the toilets and lecture theatres revealed a visceral hatred for Aborigines, none of whom I could find on campus. This was the first time I realised we were a much unloved people. The graffiti was as ubiquitous as their most frequent object was not. Later, studying law in Phillips Street, I recalled a desktop retort to the demand, Aboriginal land rights by 88, but how can fauna own land? As offensive as it was in the time before the High Court's ruling in Marbo's case, it was a succinct encapsulation of the law. I came to Sydney keen to indulge my high school love for English and history. My hopes dissipated by the end of English too. For postmodernism was not my delight. I continued to honours in history and the faculty was magnificent. My modern colonial history teachers, Professors Schroeder, Oddy and Wong, were wonderful. Then I chose American history with a strong faculty, Professors Maney, Waterhouse and two whites, Shane and Richard. I read Aboriginal history with Dr. Kuchumbas who supervised my honours thesis on the history of my mission from 1886 to 1950. I found intellectual stimulation in that department, but remained a loner. I don't remember, I had nothing to say to the world, but I certainly did not not in lectures and hardly tutorials. My best friend's mother, in the bosom of whose family I lived and who cared for me in loco parentis, an interminable lodger and a kind of socially awkward son took me to a counsellor 
at the student services. I don't think the process divined my malaise. Whatever it may have been was doubtless something I shared with numerous other young people who, having lived gregarious and center of attention lives, encounter when they enter a vast and anonymous institution. My sessions with the counsellor helped me. I wonder what these counsellors think of their brief interactions with people like the undergraduate me. Strange young men who don't understand what they feel and why their world feels so heavy. Blessed are the counsellors. May they ever help undergraduates <laughs> like the kindly lady did just by keeping my company and talking. It was Dr. Kuchumbas who saved me. She helped me find my shining star. My honours year under her supervision was defining. I developed an intellectual framework for my future life. I was confronting questions about myself, my people, my historical past and political present. I read and discussed and spoke with and recorded my elders back home. I listened and researched. I started writing and gathering my thoughts, crafting my arguments, questioning my assumptions and discerning my weaknesses. I now had purpose and understood my growing abilities were not possible without my preceding years of reading and listening to my lecturers. Learning to read at university is the key. It was an exciting time, and Dr. Kuchumbas could not have been more generous to me. I don't know I ever thanked her for what she did for me. There's no need to admit my shame for not knowing whether I had, but even if I did, the debt I owed was unrepayable. What she did for me in that honours year would last my life. I continued my solitary journey through law school, internally roiled by political thoughts, but doing and saying nothing until I returned home for two years. I got involved in the life of my community and the Cape York region. I started talking. It was like the mute has a voice. I visited Darwin and northeast Arnhem Land, where my long tutelage began at the side of my yabba, Yunupingu, whom we memorialized Thursday last, and we'll say our final goodbyes this next week. After meeting Yunupingu, I wanted to do for my pama what he did for his yongo. I took from him land rights and the disaster of welfare. Our relationship formed my convictions about what we must perforce confront. His eulogy at Kunyangara, read Thursday by Brother Jack Thompson, I urge all to read. It is too important to be cursory about what it said of Yunupingu. He was born at a time when the world was a different place. It was a young world and it was in order 
as it had been for past millennia. He was born into a world governed by the seasons, by kinship, fellowship, duty, and allegiance. The greatest allegiance then as it is now was to the song cycles, the ancestors, the law of the land, and all that is in it. As his life took shape, he would soon become aware of a new world that was forming around him. Cattlemen and policemen had come upon the Yolngu in the 1920s and 30s. The missionaries had come in the 1940s and 50s. And by the time Yuna Pingu was a young man in the 1960s, the miners had come. And so Yunupingu was raised in a world where Yolngu people had a future shock thrust upon them. For who could believe that a government without agreement would take control of a people's land and authorise the breaking down of their most sacred places? Who could imagine a government that would seek to control the Yolngu world, including the children of that world, and enable the taking of its bounty and its sacredness for profit? Who knew that minerals and furnaces and factories were of more value than people? Who could make sense of the force and strength that came in such numbers and with such conviction. And who today can imagine the powerlessness, the helplessness and despair of men and women and children who watch their sacred world destroyed in front of their eyes and who saw their elders bereft in the face of another power. This was the great challenge that Yunu Pingu faced as a young man as he came of age. It was Yunu Pingu's father, Mungaruwoi, a true warrior and peacemaker, who we now know spoke quietly into his ears and told him, be strong, look up to the future. Despite everything, Believe in yourself, believe in the power of the future. It was an instruction that he never forgot and would never forsake. The power of these words from his father set him and his family on a pathway that he followed to his final days. To fight hard for his people's rights, but to make the peace and find the settlement. To find a way forward where Yolngu and Balanda might live in harmony together. Create a life where Yolngu people could be who you are in a modern world. Ceremonial beings and economic beings, people of an ancient past, Voyages to a brilliant future, masters of ancient dance and ceremony, masters of modern technology and method. Yolngu people first, but always men and women of Australia. Last week, I visited Adelaide and travelled to Northeast Arnhem Land for Unipingu's memorial. I was reminded of a research project briefly undertaken in 1987 as a student at this law school. It concerned South Australia's most famous world-changing innovation, the Torrens system of land registration first affected by the Real Property Act of 1858. 
whose long title read, An Act to Simplify the Laws Relating to the Transfer and Encumbrance of Freehold and Other Interests in Land. I had just read The Law of the Land, recently published by eminent historian Henry Reynolds. This history became seminal in the jurisprudence of native title, cited by the High Court in its subsequent 1992 ruling in Marbo's case. Reynolds recounted the history of the South Australian Colonisation Commission, chaired by Colonel Robert Torrens. On 2 June 1836, he and John Hindmarsh, the soon-to-be governor of the new colony, were summoned to a meeting at the colonial office in London with the Secretary of State for the Colonies, Lord Glenelg. On the eve of their commission, which would hand out land titles to settlers in South Australia and thereby dispossess the Aboriginal owners. Glenelg instructed Torrens the Aborigines were not to be dispossessed of their lands except by their agreement and the payment of compensation. To Torrens chagrin, the colonial office was insistent upon the recognition of Aboriginal land rights. A provision was inserted into the letters patent of the commission, the legal authority under which it was formed. Reynolds tells how this insistence was deeply troubling to Torrens and potentially frustrating to his enterprise. He had thoughts about its abandonment. However, he decided to proceed and executed the commission under the contrivance that it would respect the rights of Aboriginal owners where they are found to exist. They then found them to exist nowhere. The Northern Territory at the time formed part of the new South Australian colony. The legal import of the letters patent arose in Millerpum versus Nabalco, the Gove land rights case, in 1971, concerning the bauxite mine established near Yerkala in opposition to the Yolngu elders, including Yunapingu's father. Justice Blackburn ruled the reference to the rights of Aboriginal people to their land was not a confirmation of land rights, but rather a kind of public relations sop to humanitarians of the Aborigines Protection Society. Torrens had not executed his commission ultra vires his letters patent. In the light of Marbo, we know the letters patent reflected the common law of England and Australia. Today in the federal court, Chief Justice Mortimer and two members of the bench handed down her decision in respect of the Yolngu entitlement to compensation for the losses they incurred as a result of the granting of the Nabalco mining lease by the Commonwealth Government. This decision confirmed the Yolngu entitlement. In 1987, at the same time I was reading Henry Reynolds' history of the South Australian Colonisation Commission, I was studying real property under Professor Butt in my law degree. I was learning the law concerning old system titles. The system pre preceding the Torrens system, governed by a large body of precedent concerning the validity 
of title to land according to a proper chain of title being established in the conveyances. Land conveyancing in the old days of OST really did require solicitors to undertake due diligence of title deeds. Unlike today, lawyers did have to do actual work for their fees. Today they charge for no real work for the validity of title under the Torrens system depends on registration rather than perfection in the history of previous transfers. Whereas OST, old system titles were defeasible for imperfection in the chain of title, Torrens title was indefeasible on the face of its registration, except for fraud. You need not worry for any defect in previous titles because the system cured any defections. Caught in this collision between the history and law, my immediate question was, of course, who was Colonel Robert Torrance? And what was his role in the creation of Torrens' title? I soon learned from articles in the library at Phillips Street there were two Robert Torrens, father and son. The father was the chairman of the Colonisation Commission and the son the inventor of the Torrens system of land title registration. I decided to undertake research, which eventually included a trip to South Australia and the Torrens Papers. My preliminary research revealed the son had experience as a landing waiter, a type of shipping clerk in the London docks, who'd come to South Australia with a determination bordering on zealotry according to the Australian Dictionary of Biography, to reform the system of land title administration in the colony. He came to call his mission the cause. The younger Torrens indefatigably campaigned to change the centuries-old OST. He succeeded in getting the South Australian Parliament of which he was for a time a member and later briefly premier to adopt his new scheme. He instituted his system in Victoria and the Torrens system was subsequently adopted across Australian and British colonies throughout the world, including certain states of the US. It was the most revolutionary change to land title administration in the history of the British Empire. My young law student's interest in this intersection between history and law concerned whether the younger Torrens deliberately created a system of land registration that would cure any problems caused by his father's execution of his original commission contrary to the letters patent issued to him by the Crown. Was this a fraternal conspiracy between father and son to make, the, make right the father's wrong? Or at least potential susceptibility to challenge or was it entirely coincidental the son created a system of land registration that would put beyond doubt the validity of titles issued by the father though the references were tantalizing I found no explicit evidence of such a conspiracy whether the passion harboured by the younger Torrens 
involved a concern about the validity of titles issued in the colony, the fact is he did create a system of land administration which would make indefeasible what was once under the common law defeasible. Following a two-year sojourn where I became involved in the public affairs of my community and the Cape York region, I returned to Phillips Street. In this time, I worked with my countrymen and women to establish the Cape York Land Council in order to fight for land rights. A Sydney office in my Balmain bedsit armed with a Macintosh computer and a facsimile machine. My lifelong work with Professor Langton started at this time. I became well acquainted with the history and law of native title that eventually emerged in Marbo's case on 3 June 1992. There had been little such jurisprudence in my law course, unlike what Professor Netheim instituted at the University of New South Wales Law School. I learned instead from independent reading and increased involvement in land rights politics. The late Eddie Marbo seconded a resolution supporting our land council in Townsville in 1990 in emulation of Unipingu's Northern Land Council a decade and a half before. I can only reflect briefly on how native title played out in Cape York and across the country in the 30 years since. Within three years, the final terrestrial native title claims in Cape York will be settled under the Native Title Act, over 98% of the land mass. My first reflection is the jurisprudence that followed the High Court's decision in Marbo and subsequently the Wick People's case, which we prosecuted in 1992 and received the High Court's ruling in 1996, has been fundamentally mistaken in respect of the concept of native title. My views on the errors made in the High Court's decision in Yorta Yorta in 2002 was set out in my essay on the High Court's centenary the following year. Essentially, my argument was that native title is properly conceptualised as possession that communal native title is an entitlement to possession as a consequence of occupation. Customary title to land is not a separate basis of title to possession, as originally assumed by Professor McNeil in his 1989 book, Common Law Aboriginal Title, which influenced the High Court in its 1992 decision. Rather, customary law is relevant to entitlement, whereas the common law apprehends that that entitlement is possession. The occupation of land by indigenous peoples at the time of British sovereignty gives rise to possessory title. As Justice Tui, the one judge that examined the possessory title thesis in his judgment in Marbo, said succinctly, possession is a conclusion of law. We have over three decades developed a large case law in the Federal and High Court of Australia 
that fundamentally misconceives the concept of native title as the product of traditional laws and customs rather than the common laws according of possession to those who are in occupation of land. This is just a cursory reflection and I have not the time here tonight to dilate my arguments. The second brief reflection is one prompted by the Ugandan scholar Mahmoud Mamdani in his 1996 book on the Rwandan genocide, When Victims Become Killers. This electrifying book has challenged me for many years that I've been contemplating its extraordinary scholarship. Colonised native communities and their identities are creatures of colonial law. Colonial law created political categories that fundamentally changed how identity and plurality worked prior to colonisation and saddled those communities with categories that would work great woe to the people subjected to them. One basic challenge Mamdani's analysis of Africa raised for me was why the date of sovereignty, an event here on the eastern seaboard of Australia, now more than two centuries old, should be so determinative of native rights to land. According to prevailing jurisprudence, native title today is dependent upon the existence of traditional laws and customs dating back more than two centuries. My approach to possession as the basis of native title would obviate this problem. It would accord to the native title holder's possession upon annexation by the Crown. A possession would crystallise as an allodial form of fee simple. There would not be the travesty of yorta yorta, where Justice Olney assumed the so-called tide of history washed away the basis of native title because of the claimed destruction of traditional laws and customs. Rather, the question was entitlement to possession that crystallised under the common law at the time of sovereignty. This is the true meaning of presumptive native title, the presumption of the common law, that beneficial possession vested in the native owners and contemporary claimants could rely upon that presumption, not just to possession, but the recovery of possession. Let me now turn to a core question I've been grappling with ever since I was a student in the late Dr. Shane White's extraordinary course on the black experience in America. My interest in African American history has been lifelong since that course. Its parallels and differences with the experience of Aboriginal people has been the subject of constant cogitation Central to that contemplation has been the relative place of class and race in our problems with these societies. As with everything, my starting framework is old school left. I have mostly not had cause to depart from that framework. In any case, I always return to it. Notwithstanding postmodernism and its new variants today, my final conviction around the relative role of class and race in understanding the African American predicament in America and the Aboriginal predicament in Australia is set out in my introduction to Mission, published in 2021. In that essay, 
I take the view that class and race became fused from the moment the first slaves arrived in Jamestown in 1619. Slave labor was from the beginning a part of the colonial political economy. At the same time, race was from the beginning the ascripta of their class position. This race-class fusion would last centuries and still survives in America today. Notwithstanding two valiant attempts made by the Americans to break that fusion. The first was the 600,000 dead of the Civil War that brought emancipation from slavery but did not break the class-race fusion because a century of the Jim Crow system would follow, preserving that terrible fusion. A second attempt was the struggle for civil rights in the 1960s, which notwithstanding its achievements, never really broke the ascription. The Black Lives Matter movement this past decade is testament that a half century after civil rights, the race-class fusion of black America remains strong. I find the race class fusion relevant to our experience. It is a trap, but our position is different from the American slaves and their descendants. This is my analysis. Dispossession from their land base, resistance to enslavement, and marginalization from the colonial economy defined the place of Aboriginal people. While domestic servitude under state laws and institutional confinement are cited as examples of slavery, the predominant story is that Aborigines would not and could not be pressed into systematic slavery. The British Empire no longer sanctioned it, and while South Sea Islanders were blackbirded to the farms of the East Coast, slavery is not a proper description of the depredations the dispossessed Aborigines suffered on the Australian frontier and in its wake. Useful analogies and comparisons could be made, but this is not how the history is properly characterised. Yes, Aboriginal people played significant roles in sectors of the economy, most famously in the northern cattle industry, but also in other rural labours, mining, railways, and other industries that had use for them. But it is our marginality to the economy, built upon our dispossession, that marks our people. The ascription of innate primitive backwardness and inferior intelligence aversion to systematic industrial work, non-existent education and limited skills, poor productivity and inclination to nomadism and unreliability, the absence of value placed on material goods and accumulation, the cultural features of our tribal obligations, and priorities that militated against work and industry. This is the mix of a scripted racial characteristics, cultural features incompatible with the merciless industrial economy of the invaders, and active resistance to the destructive economic revolution on our lands that marked our people. There is no exact term for the place 
of First Nations people in the political economy, trying to survive invasion. Contemporary parlance would call the class to which Aboriginal people predominantly belong the precariat. But the exclusion of Aborigines from the colonial economy, confined to its most extreme margins, was the dominant story. The precariat has grown from the former proletariat within a continuous class society, while many or most Aboriginal groups have no history of a place in the proletariat. In classical Marxist parlance, Aboriginal people in the colonial period and long into post-colonial times were probably lumpen proletarian, famously described by Marx and Engels in the Communist Manifesto as, quote, the dangerous class, the social scum, that passively rotting mass thrown off by the lowest layers of the old society that may here and there be swept into the movement by a proletarian revolution. Its conditions of life, however, prepare it far more for the part of a bribed tool of reactionary intrigue. Lumpen proletariat is also not quite right, though, because it refers to the declassing within an, within an evolving economy, how First Nations were overrun by a foreign economy. Nor is fringe dwellers the term we need, even though it appears to have originated in Australia. It focuses too narrowly on a certain type of settlement. I would therefore suggest the portmanteau culinariat. It meets the need for a word describing the experience of indigenous nations inextricably engulfed by colonial powers across the globe, from British Columbia to Australia and Brazil. We need a word for that experience of being not only lower in a stratified structure, but also cast to the side. An experience we instantly recognize and understand in our contacts with indigenous peoples from other continents. The experience that one's existence is under question. Unlike the existence of proletarians or slaves who have a place in the political economy, our exclusion from and resistance to the economy established on our lands and our consignment to its extreme margins defined our place in the Australian political economy as a culinariat. This race-class fusion came into existence from the beginning of colonisation. And through dispossession, subjugation, exploitation and marginalisation, the idea that Aboriginal people neither had the right to economic participation, nor any interest in or capacity for it, became the predominant idea. That fusion of racial ideology and class exclusion lasts to this day. And it informs Australian conceptions of the place of Aboriginal people in the nation's society and economy. Ours is a place of mendicancy, dependence and marginality. That we are foundation members of the passive welfare class 
that arose after the post-war welfare state is of a piece with that. I now turn to the crucial problem we're trying to solve with the Uluru Statement from the Heart and its proposals for a voice, makarata, and truth-telling. And that is what I have come to call the settler native dialectic, echoing Hegel's idea of the master-slave dialectic in his Phenomenology of Spirit in 1807. Again, it is Mamdani who illuminates his 2020 book, Neither Settler Nor Native, The Making and Unmaking of Permanent Minorities is the culmination of long study and thought. His case studies of settler societies contending with this dialectic, starting with Native Americans in the United States, South Africa, Sudan, and Israel-Palestine. This is an extremely important book. Settler societies create permanent minorities of natives who are invariably ascribed with racial differences from settlers and other ethnic groups depending on colonial imperatives to manage colonies through indirect rule. Post-colonial violence is readily explicable through Mamdani's analytical lens. To understand what is going on in Sudan today, read Mamdani. The permanent Aboriginal minority in Australia follows this analysis. The natives of Australia were excluded from the settler constitution. Their pre-existing sovereignty was ignored. The federal constitution established halfway through the colonial settlement recognised no place for the natives other than their exclusion from the nation. They were for all purposes a separate race and to the extent that land provision was made for them, the classic approach of designating reservations and homelands that separated the natives from the democracy and the economy was adopted. When we were eventually admitted into the national constitution in 1967, it was on the basis of race. The cat flap through which we entered the House of the Commonwealth with the endorsement of 90% of the Australian people was Section 5126, the Race Clause, which existed since the Constitution's inception in 1901, but specifically excluded Aborigines from its jurisdiction. As with all settler societies, perhaps with the exception of South Africa, the settler native dialectic defines the place of indigenous minorities and the Australian settler state. We're a permanent minority designated a place in Australian citizenship on the basis of race. If we are to move beyond the settler native dialectic, we will need to put settler and native behind us. This is both a historical and political task. We need to forge a citizenship that is truly inclusive of indigenous minorities and which moves beyond the idea of an Australian settler society which has native homelands for its indigenous peoples that sit separate from the democracy and the main frame of Australia. Before I turn to the voice as the first step in Australia moving beyond 
the old colonial settler native dialectic. Let me reference again Yunu Pingu's eulogy, which spoke to his lifetime adherence to the idea that his Yolngu needed to be in, quote, the main frame of the nation. He found the respect of all he met through his authority and poise. But it was his determination to do things that needed to be done and that were right that spoke to his allies and his opponents alike. And always he sought constitutional recognition and a voice for the powerless. He understood that to go forward in the nation, Aboriginal and Islander people had to be part of the main frame of the nation. That was the gift he sought in return for his life's work. We affirm that the work he did is not over, it has just begun and that the challenges he faced remain and these are our challenges now. I turn to the voice. In the lead up to his visit as Prime Minister together with his entourage of government ministers and senior bureaucrats to Northeast Arnhem Land, again of all places, in September 2014, Tony Abbott did a strange thing. I recently told the Senate Committee inquiry into the bill that will initiate this year's referendum that Abbott had proposed to me that rather than a constitutional body representing Aboriginal and Islander people advising the parliament and government, that a simpler model capable of comprehension by the Australian people would be the allocation of Senate seats for Indigenous peoples. This would follow the special seats allocated to Māori in New Zealand, put in place in the 1920s. Abbott visited New Zealand, presumably on his wife's encouragement, and had extolled the Treaty of Waitangi and other provisions that had been put in place in that country in his closing the gap speech at the opening of parliament. I recall a roadside phone call where I attempted to explain that the advisory body would be more acceptable to the public because it did not interfere with the system of democratic representation existing in Australia. The advisory body would provide advice to the parliament rather than be of the parliament. Subsequently, the concept of specially allocated seats was reported in the press. Dennis Shanahan from The Australian reported that Abbott was floating the concept which had purportedly come from his Indigenous Affairs advisers, where Chief of Staff Peter Credlin was at in all of this is unknown to me. Rosie Lewis from The Australian reported the story. It was unclear who was advising the concept if it was not Credlin. In any case, Shanahan, who reported the float, then subsequently dumped on the idea under the headline, Dedicated Senate Spots a Step Too Far. Patricia Carvellis and Rosie Lewis then reported vociferous objections from Indigenous MP Ken Wyatt and Warren Mundine. By the time I arrived in Arnhem Land, it was clear the special Senate seats balloon had been floated and burned to the ground like the Hindenburg within 48 hours. Abbott ruefully told me that the problem facing constitutional recognition was that his colleagues lacked compassion. 
The problem with Abbott's foolishness was not the political infeasibility of the Senate seats allocation, whether with his colleagues or the Australian people, but that it was not democratically defensible. It would upset the system of democratic representation in the country. The voice is not only a more feasible idea, it is a better idea. It does not change the democracy. It is a superior idea to the idea that Abbott, in his foolhardiness, floated for a brief couple of days before being blown to smithereens by the violent rejection of his colleagues. Professor Kim Rubenstein from the ANU has written the best about this. She shows that the voice will enhance citizenship by providing the voices of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people within our democratic system without derogating from that system. I commend Rubenstein's writings in relation to how the voice will provide active citizenship on the part of First Nations people. I believe that active citizenship is one of the key requisite changes needed for our people to become part of the mainframe of Australian democratic life. No longer racial groupings sitting on the margins of the democracy, distinct from the settler mainstream, out of sight and out of mind from the main game of Australia, rather a plurality of voices, actively part of the Commonwealth. Our people will continue to be represented as members of parliament and participate in the lawmaking and governmental processes of the country on the same basis as every other Australian citizen. But our voice to these parliaments will speak on behalf of our heritage and our particular needs and agendas as a community. The voice is about integration, not separatism. Some of our people may recoil at the word integration, but integration is not assimilation. We keep our identity as First Peoples, but we do this in the midst of Australia, not at its margins. We do this, as Yunapingu said, by leaning into the future, rather than retreating to the past. We advocate plurality, not apartheid. We want differences of all kinds to be respected whilst always avoiding separatism. The voice will bring us into the mainstream as the first peoples of Australia rather than denizens of racial bantustan in the remote margins of the Commonwealth. The voice will be a decisive step towards moving Australia from the old settler native society to one perhaps where we are all natives of Australia. In my quarterly essay in 2014, I proposed the disturbing idea that even Andrew Bolt would one day be indigenous to Australia. <laughs> I will risk causing a disturbance again tonight by returning to what I wrote. My point is that it is not the law that is well, the wellspring of indigeneity. It is a reality concerning the dead, the living, and the people to come, and the country to which they are tied. 
It is a similar reality of which Scruton writes when he refers to Burke's view of society as an association of the dead, the living, and the unborn. If Burke's association is real, then it is real in the sense captured in Judge Moon's most apposite definition in the Western Sahara case and in the Uluru Statement from the Heart. On this interpretation, it is theoretically possible to take Andrew Bolt seriously when he protests that he too is indigenous to this country. The bones and dust of his ancestors and all settler and immigrant Australians who made this continent their home have been accumulating and mixing with the ancient soil for 226 years. Aboriginal laws and customs recognise the connections that arise from places of birth and burial. In this spiritual sense, the Bolts are becoming indigenous to Australia. Perhaps he could recognise in turn that the bones of Unipingu's ancestors have been returning for millennia to the lands from which they arose. Australia and Australians will inex inexorably unite and share the country under one citizenship. The voice will be a decisive step towards that unity. Thank you. Yes, you've gone over time, but I think, um, I think that we don't mind. <laughs> and I guess uh, for me, um, yeah, just heartfelt thanks for such a, a wide-ranging, but also very, I mean, the, the links there between obviously law and country history and all of the many sort of fields that many of us engage in, I think it's, there is something in there for everyone to get a hook into in terms of this topic. And uh, my job here now is to go to some questions before we, um, before we hear from Teela. But I um, also want to assure members of the audience that well, I'm hoping that we've gone some way to improving the situation right. for, for students. Um, and I think that m much of what we do here, obviously, as well as has to be to listen to the experiences of someone like yourself. So um, we've got some questions that have been coming in uh, during the process of setting up this event, and so I'll be going to some of those. And some of you are in the audience, I believe. So Kalani Prakpaka from um, here in the audience has said, what can young people, especially those who can't vote, do to encourage uh, the support of the general community in terms of the voice? Okay. Now's the campaign time. <laughs> Do you want a bit more? No, yeah. <laughs> we, we've got to win. We've got to win. And <laughs> we're in a good position. We have a majority yes position that hasn't, uh, that has withstood a pretty rough start to the campaign. We've encountered a lot of heavy weather, but women are with us in great numbers. Young people are with us in great numbers. The no case and the no constituency are unfortunately older Anglo-Australians. Over 55, um, 
consumers of traditional media and they are our most implacable mm. opponents. There's a sizable group in the middle and we need young people mm. to have those conversations in their communities. There's a whole lot of goodwill, people um, that are undecided in that middle are the ones we need to speak to. Um, we have a, an extraordinary opportunity here to win a referendum notwithstanding the absence of bipartisanship. And I think we can do it. I'm absolutely confident the Australian people want to do this. Nobody wants to look back on this referendum and say, um, we, we didn't want to recognise the original people of the country. So I think young people like the person you're referring to Callum there Union, yes. is yeah. absolutely mm. important that they help us reach out to the people in the middle and bring them over to yes when the time comes. Thank you, yes. Mm. So our second question comes from John Chan, who's also in the audience. How do we elevate the conversation about the voice as the moral imperative rather than get stuck in technical detail? Yes, and that's partly my problem because I've lived in the technical details for a very long number of years. Mm. And But my kind of very quick pitch on what we're doing here is um, why are we doing this? Because we want reconciliation in the country. We want to reconcile on the basis of justice and how, we, how do we do that? We do that through the voice. We want reconciliation via the voice. Um, so I'm, I, I think that Australians want reconciliation. I think we understand the need for recognition. But just very quickly, really, it's not a matter of recognising us. It's a matter of recognising yourselves, recognising what being an Australian is. Um, if, if you don't recognise the place of Indigenous people in your idea of Australia, then what kind of idea of Australia do you have? We, we need to... We won't truly recognise ourselves as Australians until mm. there's a proper place of Indigenous people in that idea of Australia. Um, this is as much, if not more... The cause of recognition is as much, if not more, for you than it is for us. It is for us to recognise each other um, as Australians. And it's imperative, I think, for non-Indigenous people to recognise themselves properly as Australians, which includes our place in the nation. Hmm. So that's where the invitation to walk with us is, is, is seeing Australians as being like part, of, part of the solution, not just Correct. observers. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay, well, I'm going to go to the third question here, which is Ashley Wood. Um, what happens to the reconciliation movement if Australia votes no? I mean, it's just my view. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> but my view is that there will be nothing after this. If we have a no result, that's the end of reconciliation. And there's two things I've said. I've said that I, I have to shut up after that because I will have led... I've been part of a group of people that led our people down a particular road and it will have been all in vain. I will have asked my people to have faith in Australia 
and I will have been proven wrong along with my colleagues. We, we, we will have made a giant mistake. And that's why I say that the leaders at the forefront of this will just have to fall silent and a new generation will have to come up with a new strategy, a new agenda, and I will certainly support whatever agenda they come up with. Um, but, but, but I think the reconciliation agenda will, will have no credibility after this failure. It will evaporate. No way, there's no kind of uh, plan B for reconciliation. I can't see it. And, uh, and really, we will just have a, a very, we will go back to protest and protest will be never ending. Mm. And, and um, so anyway, that, that's just yeah. my view. I, I, We've I, invited you here <laughs> to, hear, to hear that. So I just want to go to one of the questions that's come yeah. in online, which is, uh, it says, via discussion on social media. Okay, many people are confused about the voice. Many are repeating misinformation from those in opposition. How do we move forward? So it goes to one of the points that you ended on there. Yeah. So we have a campaign. I think it's very positive where, you know, the, the young people, the position from the messages we're getting from young people is that why is this even a question? Why is this even a question? And so we need to mobilise young people to get out there on the day to vote and get their families out there to vote. Um, and we've got to try and really work hard on people in the middle. I think they're, they're just... Um, unlike the Republic, there won't be three positions to take. Yeah, there won't be um, three potential ways to go. There's only two. When we walk to vote, walk into the ballot box to vote, we just have to say yes or no. And we believe that the great majority of Australians will come with us on yes. Um, you know what I think about? Um, what are the Liberals and the Nationals going to say when we win? <laughs> <laughs> How so, are they going to look at themselves so that's the, yeah. in the years following, the, following this change um, when they have been so absolutely disappointing? Because um, they're going to bequeath to our children you know, they're risking bequeathing to our children a, a very dismal story. Um, and yet they're prepared to take that risk. Um, I, I just don't think that they're really thinking carefully about the day after. Mm. Well, I've been wondering about what you'll do the day after, but maybe we'll get you back and ask, <laughs> ask that again at another time. So I want to thank all of you for all of the questions. We've had hundreds of questions and obviously don't have time to deal with it tonight. But it is an indication of the interest in understanding uh, what is happening with this, with the voice and also the different perspectives that we're all, uh, all wanting to engage with and, and find out about. So thank you very much again for your sharing of not just your paper but then also response to the questions. So thank you. Please join me in thanking Noel for that. Thank you. Thank you. Am I staying here? You, you stay there. You stay there. Feel is about to come on. Thank you.
We have, we have one, more, one more part of the evening. Uh, I'd like to invite Teela Reid, who's a proud Wiradjuri and Wailwan woman, a lawyer, essayist, storyteller, and co-founder of Blackfella, uh, Blackfella Book Club, a platform that honours First Nations ancestors as the original storytellers. Currently, Teela is a Sydney-based senior solicitor practising in Aboriginal land rights litigation and is the inaugural First Nations lawyer in residence at the Sydney Law School. Please, <laughs> Teela. You stay there. Mangdangu, Injamara, thank you. Respect to you, Noel. On behalf of the University of Sydney Law School, as the First Nations lawyer in residence, um, it is with great honour that I welcome Noel back and thank him for his time here um, back at his alma mater. As Noel points out, it has been, it can be a lonely place as one of the only Aboriginal people um, in an institution within colonial foundations. His time here has no doubt shaped the trajectory of his advocacy. The practice of law takes discipline. And to arrive at this moment in time in history is truly groundbreaking. We know the world is watching. When it comes to the Uluru Statement from the Heart, the voice is simply the starting point. It is not the end goal. Makarada, peace, the end of the struggle. The invitation at the heart of the Uluru Statement is a reminder that real change happens when ideas and strategies when words on paper are put into action. We often get lost in the debate of the words in the statement, and I want to emphasise this point. The significance of the artwork around the Uluru Statement. The gift of the Jukupa law. An ancient jurisprudence that has always existed here in this place, on this land, within story of the First Nations peoples. I also want to give a special thanks to Alex Evans and her team and Lisa Pulver Jackson, um, who are responsible for organising tonight. It is so important that teams like that exist within institutions like this. To continually create space for First Nations issues from a First Nations perspective to elevate the voices of First Nations in our everyday business. I want to pay tribute to everyone here tonight and to those who are not, particularly to the many giants who have fought the front line and are now with our ancestors. I was a working group leader on section 5126 at the Sydney Constitutional Dialogue that culminated in the Uluru Statement from the Heart. During that process and that dialogue, it was Uncle Sol Belair, a land rights giant who took me under his wing. Uncle Sol, this is for you and many other giants like Mumshell. So in closing, I am going to recite for you the Uluru Statement from the heart. We gathered at the 2017 National Constitutional Convention, coming from all points of the southern sky, make this statement from the heart. Our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander tribes are the first sovereign nations of the Australian continent and its adjacent islands and possessed it under our own laws and customs. This our ancestors did according to the reckoning of our culture from the creation, according to the common law from time immemorial and according to science more than 60,000 years ago. This sovereignty is a spiritual notion, the ancestral tie between the land or Mother Nature, 
and the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples who were born there from remain attached there too and must one day return thither to be united with our ancestors. This link is the basis of the ownership of the soil, or better, of sovereignty. It has never been ceded or extinguished and coexists with the sovereignty of the crown. How could it be otherwise? That a people's possessed a land for 60 millennia and this sacred link disappears from world history in merely the last 200 years. With substantive constitutional change and structural reform, we believe this ancient sovereignty can shine through a fuller expression of Australia's nationhood. Proportionally, we are the most incarcerated peoples on the planet. We are not an innately criminal people. Our children are aliened from their families at unprecedented rates. It cannot be because we have no love for them. And our youth languish in detention, in obscene numbers. They should be our hope for the future. These dimensions of our crisis tell plainly the structural nature of our problem. This is the torment of our powerlessness. We see constitutional reforms to empower our people and take a rightful place in our own country. When we have power over our destiny, our children will flourish. They will walk into worlds and their culture will be a gift to their country. We call for the establishment of a First Nations voice enshrined in the Constitution. Makarata is the culmination of our agenda, the coming together after a struggle. It captures our aspirations for a fair and truthful relationship with the people of Australia and a better future for our children based on justice and self-determination. We seek a Makarata Commission to supervise a process of agreements between governments and the First Nations and truth-telling about our history. In 1967, we were counted. In 2017, we seek to be heard. As we leave base camp and start our trek across this vast country, we invite you to walk with us in a movement of the Australian people for a better future. And in 2023, let's vote yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, there you go. It's been a great evening and uh, wonderful to have colleagues such as Teela amongst us and we're very privileged to have you join us here tonight, Noel. Uh, we are now at that point in the evening where we want to encourage you to take the time to build your cultural understanding, to carry on what you've heard in discussions, to think about all of this, this material in your conversations. Be bold, be informed and stay engaged. Listen to the National Centre for Cultural Competence have put together a resource to understanding the voice to parliament and you can find that on the website. And please note that this is not, this is sorry, the first event uh, in the Voices on the Voice series. So there will be future forums for discussion over the coming months. Watch this space. We'll have all the links and information to resources um, that we've mentioned and on-demand uh, films and so on available through Sydney Ideas and uh, its website. So I wanted to just sort of end on, on a note and it's actually a quote from something Noel published on the weekend. He wrote, the ca long campaign has not started yet. It will start in earnest when the referendum bill passes the parliament. Thank you very much. Noel Pearson, it's been a pleasure having you here. Please all know that we'll also continue the conversation uh, this evening and also uh, further afield. This has been a Sydney Ideas Voices on the Voice event. I'm Jennifer Barrett. Thank you and good night. Thank you. Thank you.